Hi, we're Katrina Leggett and Aviv Zohar. We're both professors of computer science at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Computer scientists are interested in studying models of how things spread, like memes and computer viruses, and the same basic models are used to study biological viruses. Generally, there are two phases to controlling the spread of a pandemic. First, when the virus hasn't spread to very many people, you try to contain it, to isolate the infected people from the healthy people entirely in hopes that the virus might die out without infecting many people. Unfortunately, with the current coronavirus, we are past that stage. Too many people are infected in too many places for the virus to be isolated effectively. So we've moved on to the second phase, mitigation. The goal in the mitigation phase is to slow the spread of the virus enough that the healthcare system is not overwhelmed. So there are enough hospital beds, protective gear, ventilators, and medications for those who need them, and also to buy time in order to put procedures in place to care for the most vulnerable. Slowing the spread of the virus can also buy time until a vaccine is invented, and as we'll see shortly, slowing the spread of the virus can also reduce the total number of people who ever get infected. A simple epidemiological model can help give some insight into the importance of mitigation. The model we'll look at here is known as the SIR model for S, susceptible, I, infectious, R, recovered. In this model, susceptible people are healthy and haven't had the virus, so they're not immune yet. Infectious people are those who are sick with the virus and can give it to others. And we think of people as recovered once they've had the virus and can't get again or give it to others. Either they're immune or they're dead. At first, one person is sick and everyone else is susceptible. A sick person, maybe they don't even realize yet that they're sick, meets a bunch of people during the time in which he's contagious. Maybe he goes to work and interacts with colleagues. Maybe he has dinner with his extended family. This sick person goes on to infect some fraction of the people he meets, and they become sick. The sick person recovers and becomes immune to the virus, but the new sick people go on to infect others. The number of people that a sick person typically infects is known as R0, written R0, the basic reproductive number of the disease. As long as sick people each typically infect more than one new person, meaning the effective reproductive rate R is bigger than one, the virus will continue to spread. But if a sick person typically infects less than one new person, meaning the effective reproductive number is less than one, the virus will start to fade away. Suppose, for example, that each sick person infects two new people and that the process of those new people getting infected and becoming contagious takes six days. On the first day, we'll have one sick person. On the seventh day, we'll have two. On the 13th day, four. On day 19, we'll have eight sick people. So far, it doesn't seem too bad, but at this rate, on day 187, we would have more than two billion sick people. That's exponential growth. So although in this model it took us about 60 days to get our first thousand patients, the second thousand only took six more days. And although it took us about 120 days to get our first million patients, the second million only took six more days, and so on. This type of growth will quickly overwhelm any medical system. In order to slow the growth, it's useful to reduce the number of susceptible people that a sick person might meet, using social distancing measures like staying home and closing schools. Hygiene measures like hand washing reduce the chance that a susceptible person will actually be infected when she meets a sick person. Even small changes in social distancing and in the rate of infection can have a dramatic impact. Suppose instead of an average of two new infections per sick person, we could get that down to an average of one and a half. In the previous model, the virus would have hit 2 billion patients at around day 187. But in this new, slower spread model, the number of sick people at that point would only be about 287,000, much more manageable. The other key aspect of the model is that once someone has had the virus, they generally can't be reinfected. If more than half of the population is already recovered and immune from the virus, 
typically at least one of the two people a sick person originally would have infected would already be immune, and thus she will only transmit the virus to less than one new person. That reproductive rate of less than one will make the virus fade away quickly. Of course, people who are very socially active or who meet many people in the course of their work are at risk of continuing the epidemic. Given this model, we can use math and computer simulations to get predictions of how an epidemic might progress. Of course, the predictions are only as good as the model, and the model we are using here makes a number of simplifying assumptions. You can see here that using a reproductive number of 2, the SIR model predicts that there will be a catastrophic blow-up in the number of cases around day 190, when nearly 16% of the world's population is infectious simultaneously, vastly more than the medical system could possibly cope with. And then the virus will only die off once about 80% of the population has had it. Using instead a reproductive rate of one and a half, there will still be a substantial blow up in the number of cases from around day 350, but then the virus will die off once about 59% of the population has had it. Suppose we've been going along with a reproductive rate of two, and then at around day 104, when we have around 200,000 global patients, we rapidly implement extreme measures to reduce the reproductive rate to just one half. It looks pretty good. The number of active infections decreases rapidly, and 100 days later, there are only 1,000 global cases, nearly undetectable. At that point, suppose we get tired of living under extreme quarantine and its economic impacts. So suppose at that point, we reduce social distancing measures and we jump back up to a reproductive rate of, say, one and a half. Because there weren't yet enough immune people in the population to help keep the spread in check, the virus would quickly spiral out of control again. A similar effect could happen if the reproductive rate were lowered due to warm weather during the summer, but later returned to a higher value in the fall. The epidemic could return. There are a few takeaway lessons here. First, on the positive side, by practicing social distancing and good hygiene, you're not only reducing your chance of getting the coronavirus or of giving it to your friends and family, you're also helping make sure that the virus doesn't overwhelm our hospital system. You're helping reduce the total number of people who will ever need to get the disease, and you're increasing the chances that we successfully wait it out until there's an effective vaccine. Second, on the sobering side, taking extreme measures to reduce the reproductive rate of the virus will not have a long-term impact if those measures are only taken for a few weeks. In order to prevent the healthcare system from becoming overwhelmed, these extreme measures will need to be in place either until an effective vaccine has been developed and widely deployed, or until a substantial fraction of the population has already had the disease. And since the point of these measures is to make sure the disease spreads slowly, it will take a long time to get to the point where enough people are immune. We're talking months. Our best hope is to try to replicate the effects of extreme long-term quarantine measures by instead targeting those extreme quarantine measures to people who are most likely to be infectious. This could potentially allow others to mostly return to their normal lives and for the economy to continue functioning. In order to target quarantine measures effectively, we will need more widespread testing for the virus, and we will need to improve our techniques for tracking down the people that a sick person might have infected. We should be careful, though, not to blindly embrace widespread surveillance that might undermine our privacy, our democracies, and our freedoms. We hope that you found this exploration useful, and we wish you the best of health.